<clears throat> Chapter 21, World War I and its Aftermath. In 1914, a precarious international peace in Europe slid into total global war on the basis of what seemed to be a series of minor incidents. The major powers of Europe were organized in 1914 into two competing alliances. The Triple Entente, later known as the Allies, linked Britain, France, and Russia. The Triple Alliance, later the Central Powers, united Germany, uh, the Austria-Hungarian -Hung Empire, and Italy. The chief conflict was between Great Britain and Germany, however, and it boiled over when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Serbian separatists during a parade. That local controversy escalated through the complex system of alliances that had held Europe together for decades. Germany used the incident to declare war in France, and Great Britain jumped into the war to support the alliance, while Russia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire formalized war shortly thereafter. Within just a few months, all of the major players had chosen a side in virtually the entire European continent, and a part of Asia was embroiled in a continent-wide Great War. Wilson asked Americans to remain impartial in the European war. Most Americans sympathized with Britain, however. Economic reality, specifically a British blockade, also made it impossible for the U.S. to deal with the war on equal terms. Brutal German tactics, too, pushed many, aware, uh, many Americans away from supporting Germany in the conflict. The sinking of the British passenger liner, the Lusitania, by German submarines was the nail in the coffin. 1,198 civilians, including 128 Americans, died in that submarine attack. American domestic policies, though, prevented Wilson from committing the United States to the war. The question of whether America should take military and economic preparations for war sparked a heated debate between pacifists and interventionists uh, in the United States. Though Wilson began to uh, build up the American military, Democrats used the slogan, he kept us out of war, at the Democratic Presidential Convention in 1916, and Wilson squeaked out a narrow victory to earn a second presidential term while war waged in Europe. Early in the second term, Wilson supplied his own justification for American intervention that united public opinion. In a speech before Congress in January of 1917, he presented a plan for a post-war order in which a permanent League of Nations would maintain a new peace, a peace without victory. This will later sort of get codified with the League of Nations. Germany reacted to the speech by unleashing unrestricted submarine warfare. against American and allied ships, and they, they took this as a declaration of war. And Wilson had survived that presidential contest and, and so had nothing to uh, lose politically, so he could largely do what he wanted to do. In late February, Americans uh, intercepted a telegram sent by the German Foreign Minister Zimmerman to the government of Mexico. It proposed that in the event of war between Germany and the US, Mexico should join with Germany against America uh, in return for their lost provinces of the north, that is, New Mexico, Texas, California, uh, after the war. The Zimmerman Telegram, as it was called, inflamed public opinion and built immediate anti-German sentiment for the war. Less than one month later, the, a revolution in Russia put into place a new Republican government, which made the idea of America joining the Allies much more palatable to Americans. On the rainy evening of April 2nd, 1917, two weeks after the German subs had tor uh, torpedoed three more American ships, Wilson appeared before Congress to ask for a declaration of war against Germany, uh, and he was granted it. European armies, stuck at a bloody stalemate for years, were exhausted by the time Americans entered the war. America's Navy immediately helped limit Allied losses at sea, but a major commitment of American troops became necessary when Russia, led by Vladimir Lenin, and his new communist government cut a deal with the Central Powers and retreated back home to Russia, freeing up more German troops for the Western Front. Despite some controversy, Wilson won passage of the Selective Service Act in the US, or the military draft in mid-May, which brought another 3 million American men into the United States military. And that new crop of soldiers, the American Expeditionary Force, finally hit the European continent. Uh, they used their raw numbers and their fresh legs to beat back every German advance they faced uh, faced with an invasion of their own country, German military leaders pressed for an armistice or an end to the fighting instead of a total surrender, foreshadowing. 
On November 11, 1918, more than four years after it began, the Great War shuddered to a close. World War I was a proving ground for a new range of military technologies. Trench warfare epitomizes the conflict. The enormous destructive power of newly improved machine guns forced men into ditches they built to hold their position. Anyone in traditional open field position was an easy target for machine guns. New technology too uh, threatened men safe in their trenches. Tanks and flamethrowers and chemical weapons, think mustard gas, and fighter planes made it possible to attack soldiers from far greater distances and with uh, far deadlier technology. The United States uh, Navy modernized quickly in the war and came to rely on diesel engines, turbine propulsion, uh, propulsion, hydraulic gun controls, electric light and power, wireless telegraphy, and advanced navigational aids. All of the techno technology made possible the stunning number of casualties attributed to the Great War. Nearly 9 million European men were killed in the war. One million British men, 1.7 Frenchmen, two million German men, 1.7 million Russian men. The list goes on. Only, only 112,000 Americans died in the war, uh, due mostly to our brief involvement. Many of them died from the dangerous flu epidemic sweeping the globe in 1917. All of this new technology required new systems of economic and logical uh, logistical management to keep up. The federal government appropriated $32 billion for World War I, where the annual budget of the United States had rarely breached $1 billion previously. To raise money for the war effort, the government had sold $23 billion in Liberty War bonds to the American public. It also put new heavy taxes on excess profits on corporations and individuals in high tax brackets. To organize the economy for war, Wilson implemented uh, war boards to advise American industries to ensure that war needs would be met without paralyzing the domestic economy. The War Industry uh, Industries Board coordinated government purchases, purchases of military supplies, but was prone to corruption, while the National War Labor Board pressured industry to grant important concessions to workers in order to avoid strikes that might, might hurt the flow of goods to the war front during these years. To ensure American commitment to the cause, Wilson's Committee on Public Information organized a massive U.S. propaganda campaign. 75 million pieces of printed material went out in support of the war, and journalists were encouraged to exercise self-censorship when reporting war news. To suppress internal dissent, the Committee on Public Information paid for advertisements in magazines that implored U.S. citizens to report to the authorities any evidence among their neighbors of disloyalty to the American cause. Citizens groups emerged to root out disloyalty in German American communities and to, and to ban expressions of German culture, including food, music, uh, German writers. Many German Americans were fired from their wartime jobs on the suspicion they could be secret saboteurs. The Espionage Act of 1917 gave the government new tools to combat spying, uh, sabotage, or obstruction of the war effort. The Espionage and Sedition Acts put them as a, a technology here, uh, made it illegal to publicly express opposition to the war and allowed officials to prosecute anyone who criticized the president or the government. During this time, American First Amendment protections went largely unrecognized. These tools were put into use against the Socialist Party and the international workers of the world, the industrial workers of the world. In all, over 1,500 people were arrested and jailed in 1918 for opposing the U.S. war effort. In his search for a new world order, Wilson laid out his aims for the post-war world. His grandiose 14 points fell into three broad categories, the 14 points. Eight of his 14 points were recommendations for adjusting post-war territorial boundaries in Europe that were at the heart of what this war was all about. Five were general principles that would govern international conduct, including freedom of the seas, open covenants instead of secret treaties between countries, reductions in weapons stockpiles, free trade, and the impartial mediation of colonial claims. And finally, a League of Nations that would implement these new principles and uh, territorial adjustments and resolve future international conflicts. The hope was that this war was the war, uh, the war to end all wars, that through that professionalization movement that we were talking about, and just 20th, 20th century progressivism, we could end the conditions by which war occurred 
on the face of the globe. His vision reflected his belief that the world was capable of a just and efficient global government. But other European powers and American Republicans within the United States were in no mood for a generous egalitarian peace process after Germany put down its guns, not surrendered, remember. At the Paris Peace Conference, Wilson was greeted by European leaders who wanted to punish Germany harshly. And he was unable to win approval of some of his broadest 14 points principles. His only major accomplishment was the creation of a permanent international organization to oversee world affairs. In early 1919, the Allies voted to accept the covenant of that League of Nations. Wilson presented the Treaty of Versailles to the American Senate shortly after the Paris Peace Conference. He wanted them to ratify it. But he ran into, into vindictive Republican opposition. Not to be done in, he embarked on a grueling 8,000 mile cross country speaking tour to arouse public support for the League of Nations and, and what they'd agreed at at Versailles. But he suffered a series of health problems during the trip, including a stroke, and that treaty went unapproved in Congress. At home after the war, the nation struggled to convert the pre-war economy into a post-war one. Inflation raged, prices rose 15% a year for a time, and 5 million people lost their jobs, while labor unrest increased dramatically after the war. 1919 saw an unprecedented wave of labor strikes. In Seattle, walkout by shipyard workers evolved into general strikes that brought the entire city to a standstill. In Boston, police struck, uh, police struck to dem uh, demand recognition of their union. The city erupted into violence and looting, and the National Guard had to be called in by President Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge declared, there is no right to strike against the public safety and tapped into broad middle-class hostility towards unions and strikes. He helped to defeat the greatest strike of the era, one that involved 350,000 steel workers across several Midwestern cities, which climaxed in Gary, Indiana, where 18 strikers were killed. Though black World War I veterans were celebrated alongside their white counterparts when they came back after the war, white Americans did little to incorporate blacks into daily American life. Blacks, though, were more determined than ever to fight for their rights. Nearly half a million blacks moved to the industrial north during the war from the rural South where the racial climate had become savage and murderous. In 1919, more than 70 blacks were lynched in the South. And in the North, white workers convinced that blacks were making the workplace more competitive, increased tensions in cities like Chicago and St. Louis. In Chicago, during the red summer of 1919, the stoning death of a black teenager near a white beach led to rioting that shut down the city for a week, rioting where for the first time, since the slave revolts, blacks fought back against white harassment and the birth of black nationalism was born. Many Americans regarded the industrial warfare and racial violence of 1919 as a frightening omen of instability and radicalism. After the Russian revolution of 1917, communism was no longer simply a philosophical theory, but the basis of an important global government. In addition, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, or the Soviet Union, what had been Russia, announced the formation of a communist international whose purpose was to export revolution all across the world. The fear was that communism would come by force to the United States unless actively crushed. Pockets of radicals did exist in America in this era, and they did attack people in positions of power in the United States occasionally, using coordinated attacks and bomb detonations. One such bomb killed 38 people on Wall Street. States began to pass laws to imprison political radicals who sympathized with communism. But the greatest contribution to the fear of communist influence came from the federal government itself. On New Year's Day, 1920, the United States Attorney General and his young assistant, a very young J. Edgar Hoover, They orchestrated a raid on alleged radical centers throughout the country and arrested more than 6,000 suspected radicals. The anti-communist Red Scare was born. Though most Americans feared the influence of communism, some stood up to the federal government's heavy-handed, often unconstitutional efforts to root out this aversion. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, was born in this era. People accused of political dissent began to lean more heavily on the Bill of Rights to protect themselves and their politics, espionage and sedition acts, they began to push back against them. The Supreme Court in this era tilted in favor of the freedom of speech and in doing so it put in place legal precedents we still rely on today. 
In many ways, 1920 and the ratification of the 19th Amendment, the women's, uh, women's right to vote, truly marked the end of the era of the progressive reform in the United States. Wilson's successor, Warren G. Harding, a Republican, embraced no soaring ideals, only a vague promise of return to normalcy in America. His election signaled a retreat from the spirit of idealism that had marked the progressive eras of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson.